Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, lecture on mourning and melancholia with Professor John Mills. John is a Canadian philosopher, a psychoanalyst and a clinical psychologist. His principal theoretical contributions have been in the philosophy of the unconscious, a critique of psychoanalysis, philosophical psychology, value inquiry and the philosophy of culture. His clinical contributions are in the areas of attachment pathology, trauma, psychosis, and psychic structure. And today we're going to be looking at Freud's paper, Mourning and Melancholia, and all that that has brought to the field of grief and grief theories uh, in the last hundred years. So John, you're very welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to our dialogue. So maybe we'll start, John, with your own introduction to the paper. Um, would you would you be so kind as to take us away with that of uh, an overview of of how you see Freud's teachings of the day? Uh, sure. Um, well, let me first preface it by stating my bias, and uh, as a as a Freud scholar um, and um, so, you know, someone who I feel that if, you know, has contributed greatly to contemporary understanding of psychopathology. Um, this is one of his outstanding papers in, um, in his uh, metapsychology uh, days, meaning writing on various aspects of, of psychic uh, development and structure. Um, and he really, in many ways, has prefigured the entire contemporary psychiatric culture of today. Um, we didn't, I mean, what we understand as depression, uh, major depressive disorder, clinical depression, what do you want to call it today, um, is really no different than, than what Freud introduced to, uh, to the world back in uh, 19... Actually, 1915 is when he first wrote the paper. It didn't come out until 1917, um, mainly due to the, the war. Um, but anyway, in this very important um, paper, he brings together um, so many different aspects of, of normal, if you want to use that word, um, if not normative, psychological development uh, around how we become attached to, to objects. And we use the term object uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, a love object could be a person, of course, um, but it could be certain functions that a person uh, or a, um, an, an entity um, or uh, an aspect of, of something can can um, form form in in terms of our relationship to it. Um, so, what Freud was interested in is 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 trying to show parallel processes between uh, mourning or grief or bereavement and um, certain depressive currents that go through our lives. And I, I say our lives because. There's really no one who has never um, experienced living without having to slip into melancholic moods at the very least, but more depleted or depleted uh, internal states of being. Um, however, these things have extremes. So um, Freud was interested in seeing these parallel processes between mourning and, and melancholia with certain qualitative uh, degrees of distinction. So, um, you know, in, in mourning, um, you, of course, are going to have an emotional reaction to the loss of a loved person. And, um, it, but it could also be, um, you know, mourning the loss of some abstract value um, or an ideal, um, you know, such as uh, uh, how one's country may have changed or loss of liberty, um, 
uh, to the degree that you'll even see fans of team sports uh, become depressed when uh, uh, they they either lose or some become depressed if their team wins because unconsciously they're attached to be to to the underdog. But I'm I'm getting uh, a little bit ahead of myself. Um, but this normal or normative mourning process uh, of you know feeling this emotional pain due to loss um, it can lead to depression. And what is well? First of all, what is depression? I mean, this is also debatable. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's what the uh, DSM uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says, uh, but many of the, of the qualities or qualitative states that Freud describes in this seminal paper are very much part of uh, the diagnostic criterion for clinical depression. So, um, you know, having a, a you know, depressed uh, or depleted mood for a great deal of the day, um, for an inhibition in, in activities uh, uh, where they used to find things more pleasurable or, um, or, or had certain interests that would keep them occupied or find meaning in these things. This often is um, eclipsed when a person enters into uh, a depressed state, um, that there's a, a feeling of, um, of a loss of interest in the outside world in general. And, and there's also these uh, feelings of emptiness, uh, aloneness, ab abandonment, um, lack, uh, absence, um, that leads to really emotionally painful feelings of dejection that um, are often compartmentalized uh, in, in some people. I mean, they're not in really touch with their inner life so much as they're in touch with how incapacitated they feel. And, and of course, this spills over in people's feelings that they, they're just not really able or capable of loving or giving or doing things for others in the family. But um, there are more qualitatively um, uh, debilitating states in depression where a person you know, may just feel a, a complete lack of self-regard. Um, they have horrible self-revilings uh, against themselves. They feel worthless. Now, these are things that are absent in mourning. I mean, usually a person is not going to fall into those states because, you know, their loved one has, has passed. Um, so this kind of uh, turning, turning on the self is what we see in more clinical states of depression to, to the degree that they could have a, a delusional expectation of punishment. Um, you know, they feel morally despicable. Um, they, um, you know, their reality testing is uh, suspended in some ways. And of course, it, it could lead to, you know, suicide feelings. Uh, so um, the notion, though, in, it, with, with this mourning and, and crossover into depressive states, is there tends to be a certain withdrawal of attachments to others. Um, but in depression, the object loss is, is really experienced unconsciously. Whereas, whereas in mourning, the person is highly conscious of the lost object. And, and so um, it can lead to a great deal of uh, variation in, our, in clinical presentations, in our experiential world, that we have around grief. Um, and, you know, in one of Freud's quite famous quotes in that essay is that, um, you know, in, uh, I'm trying to paraphrase it here. Um, in mourning, it's the world which has become poor and empty, but in melancholia, it's the ego or the self itself. And um, 
uh, and so those are some distinctions, the fine distinctions that are important. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what we've come across in other lectures that uh, this project is featuring is very much mourning. It's there's a very tangible loss. There's a reason for the despair. Um, there, it's, it's very clear what's going on and um, what's causing the pain, the suffering, the grief. Whereas with melancholia, um, you know, Freud, you know, links them, but also differentiates them. As you say there, we often don't even know what is the lost object. Um, and, and I'd love to drill down into this a little bit with you, if you're willing, John. You know, when we talk about object relations and attachment, um, how do we support the person who is melancholic or who is suffering from depression when we are faced with them? Um, when the object is not clear, perhaps it was a less than perfect maternal object or paternal object, or perhaps there wasn't even a maternal object. Um, would you say a little bit about that? When we don't, when we when we haven't had that object, yet we are unconsciously mourning it, and maybe spending a lot of our lives. And you allude to this in your lecture, either in the melancholia or the pursuit of a, of a function and um, by pursuing another object to perform that maternal function? Well, yes, um, they, they're quite interrelated. Um, and I just want to preface my response to, there is a difference between, um, you know, a, a clinical presentation and a, a normative presentation. And of course, people who come to me or seek out, uh, you know, therapy or or bereavement services with yourself, of course, are coming to you with a clearly identifiable reason for being there. Whereas the vast majority of people don't, and they just have to suffer, you know, out there silently or independently. Um, so, um, in terms of what I see clinically, I'm, I'm going to also assume that that exists in the general population, that, but that not all people have um, sought out help to, to really, you know, to deal with it. Um, or have the, notion the, privilege that, of, the privilege of being able to afford it financially yeah. and time-wise. You know, uh, psychoanalysis is, is a very privileged um, service, yeah. Yes, you know, well, certainly in its original form, um, but today for most people, most in most places, uh, it's, it's more of a psychoanalytic therapy uh, than, than your traditional um, five days a week on the couch, uh, which um, is obviously relegated to the, the wealthy and elite. Um, but uh, the same processes are still happening, and the issue is that what is the person who is undergoing a melancholic uh, internal process, how, what is the relationship this person has to the lost person or to the lost object? Because again, it could be that a person as you've alluded to is having a relationship to absence or, or to lack or, um, uh, a, a loss of a certain, let's say, maternal function that never was fully present. And, and um, uh, this is very, can be extremely painful for people. Uh, in fact, you know, people develop symptoms, uh, in this instance, depressive symptoms, as more or less a way of distancing themselves from a full uh, realization of what of what unconsciously they're experiencing. And so a symptom itself is, uh, is a defense. It is uh, the manifestation or compromise of internal conflicts. And um, it's the internal conflicts that uh, are deeply, uh, they, they resonate deeply within psychic structure and they can overwhelm uh, a person to such a degree as that they they have to distance themselves from being in touch with what's truly disturbing them. So the notion of or the complexity around 
the the person who's uh, who's either breathing or, or depressed, what is their relationship with to the lost person? This is um, you know high, highly important uh, because people just don't have any kind of relationship to people. Uh, this is why uh, attachment processes are so important. Um, you become emotionally connected to very few select caretakers in your early life for a reason. Um, and it's not just like you have an attachment to the family pet. Uh, it's not the same as your parents, let's say, or their sur uh, parental surrogates or siblings or extended family. And with that comes internalizing uh, who they are or were and, and also the functions that they would serve uh, for you psychically, as well as um, basically all the hangups that you can have uh, because of the, uh, the, the relationship um, um, is strained or was absent or was constricted. Uh, or was presented in a very uh, circumcised uh, way, and and um, it, uh, uh, it it by nature is an ambivalent relationship, and, and so um, these ambivalent feelings will come up uh, in loss, and um, uh, of course uh, some people who've had who've had more developmental traumas. They've had more attachment deficits, or if they've had, you know, uh, abuse of all types that come up, that can all come up when uh, you know a loved one dies, and they may not even be aware of it. It's just unconsciously being evoked, and the symptoms will start to speak for themselves. So some of the symptoms that we might see, John. Um, are, as you say, a, a depression, perhaps addiction, um, transference issues, overeating, um, ad addicted to sex or relationships. You know, we, we see all of these symptoms. And I guess this is where, when we look at, say, something like cognitive behavioral therapy that focuses just on those behaviors, there's uh, so many layers missing from that treatment. Isn't there like if if those behaviors are a defense to the grief um, of not having that object unless we grieve? So so how do we begin to bridge? You know, how do we begin to bring people to that place of mourning an object that they didn't even know they were missing? That's a very good question. Uh, um, that or they have a uh, sense of it probably you know the 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 question is is so pointed it it uh, is to immediately uh, presuppose that the person is not aware of their own internal um, life that they they are they're lacking self consciousness or self reflexivity around what that person means and represents to them in their own psyche and their own self-representation of themselves relating to that person. And, and so um, when we have certain types of therapies that will encourage, um, you know, do these kinds of uh, behavioral techniques or um, the step-by-step -step method uh, will help you deal with the symptoms, that it completely glosses over what's causing the symptoms to begin with. And so um, uh, from a psychodynamic point of view, we want to become more aware of our inner world, not less aware of it. And with the more, the more um, attunement we have and the more knowledge we have about our unconscious, and how it becomes more conscious to us, um, we become aware of the wealth of 
uh, of all these emotional states, these needs, these desires, these defenses, these conflicts, these nasty things that we don't want to know anything about whatsoever because we have the desire not to know. And uh, if we then collude, particularly the therapist colludes with a technique that says, just do these things and you'll feel happy. Um, it's really reinforcing the very thing you don't want. Uh, that means avoiding the real issues that need to be resolved. And the only way to do that is to uh, try to engage into a process where you as a therapist are, are a, a client's guide to, to help them open up to their interior and, and let the process unfold as it needs to unfold. And, and the more that one becomes uh, in touch with their interior, uh, they, the more they can uh, become aware of what they're experiencing it allows for certain uh, emotional experiences to be um, had and, and, and transformed and in many ways uh, allowed a life uh, for the first time. Um, and and when, you know, when a person is able to do that, they're, they're becoming more fully human and, and, uh, and embracing the reality of the life within. And, and, and over time, by engaging that, and I, I, I mention over time because it's a process. It's not something that could just be fixed just like that. It's not like getting an oil change or something. Um, then one starts to uh, digest and re-digest what their, their feelings, their conflicts, their desires, their wishes, their disappointments, to that lost person. And, and, and with that, of course, comes a certain degree of, of pain, uh, but one can't, one can't get through that pain um, without being honest. You, you just can't buy your way out. You know, a pill is not going to take it away. It might take the edge off for some people. Um, usually it's a placebo, but um, the, it never really is going to get at working through these internal conflicts. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, an, it has to be done uh, in order to be able to, not, to get out of that state. And I'm Whether it be a, I'm wondering, John, is there a way around it that some people find that works for them in their lives where they do find a replacement object? You know, we hear people talk about, I found the love of my life. They're my everything. Um, and they have this euphoria. And, you know, of course, if that person dies or something happens, the relationship will be back to square one. But let's say it works out, you know, does that work? Or is that just a temporary band-aid? And will the original losses always come back? Or always linger there somewhere in the unconscious? Well, you, you've, you've, I think, answered your own questions. Um, that on one hand, um, people in mourning uh, who um, is, is different because one, you know, a process of time allows um, one to let go of the lost, you know, person or the lost love object. Um, it's usually slow and, you know, gradual and sequential in some ways. But um, it allows for the overcoming of the loss uh, to such a degree that one can then reattach to new love objects. So, of course, um, when people uh, lose a significant loved one, um, they, ha they, they might go through um, a process that is, you know, a year or more, and then they meet a, a new a new person and they reattach. And, and there's nothing pathological about that. What would be more pathological would be the person who needs to flee from the immediacy of their loss into a new object as a, a displacement 
uh, for not wanting to have the courage to work through their own feelings of loss. So we see this all the time in breakups and relationships, you know, uh, whether it be dating, whether it be divorce, that someone's got a new uh, replacement object or a sex object, uh, you know, right away in order to manage their own anxiety and, and um, depletion. In, in many ways, we call, we call that like a manic defense. So somebody manically flees into the new objects, which they often idealize, right? The best person that could ever come around and that splitting into the ideal helps at least temporarily people stave off that pain but they're trying to deny it. They're trying to repress it, dissociate, and lie to themselves. Um, they're also diminishing their value psychically by doing that. And um, the, the, real, the real issue with loss is just coming to terms with um, the types of functions and relatedness that one would have liked to have had if they didn't have it. So uh, to answer your question, um, it can be uh, very defensive and unhealthy in some ways to prematurely uh, reconnect, but in other ways, it's very normative, and we, we of course, want people to be happy. Hmm. Well, I have another question, John, um, which maybe speaks to the philosopher in you rather than the psychoanalyst. And is it ever the case where, you know, we meet individuals, maybe poets, maybe philosophers, um, people who like to create, who have that sort of live in that air of melancholia, um, where the lost object is not so much a parent um, or family, um, but more source, connection with a divine you know, that, that, that yearning to be merged again with wherever we came from or whatever our source is. Do you ever come across that in clinical practice? Well, um, yes, I do, uh, as well as in my own personal life, um, that we see people wanting all the time to have a connection to something greater than just um, our personal ego or sense of self or the immediacy of our you know, uh, home environment or work, but they're constantly you know, uh, having a spiritual craving. And um, whatever that means for people, I mean, it can be, entire, it can be entirely um, religious or it can be secular. And um, I do think that people who are depressed, uh, who are addicts, who retreat into objects as compensation or self-objects to ameliorate internal anxiety states or um, a lack of self-cohesion, uh, whether it be through booze or drugs or like you mentioned earlier, just sexual relationships that are ephemeral, they go from person to person. They're trying to fill a void and um, or binge eating or, or whatever activities that take people away from those deep longings. And, and this is what differentiates um, in many ways um, Freud from Jung. Uh, you know, Jung believed in a, in a spiritual or religious instinct to use his term in those days, that we were searching for the numinous in our lives. And numinosity uh, means different things to different people, but it could certainly be uh, in, in the, uh, you know, in the uh, Roman tradition of the term numen is a divinity, a divinity principle that we're seeking. Um, and uh, other people refer to it as um, uh, transcendence. Or, or something where they feel that they can rise above their, their current state of existence. And, and so it's such a very important, um, not only topic, but an important, important aspect of, of, a, of an individuation process, to use Jung's term, that uh, we're all involved in it if you, if you are tuned to it. 
And, and the more that a person is looking for it or in pursuit of it or, or just stumbling through, uh, you know, ecstasy, um, that, that we're trying to, in many ways, find spiritus, uh, whether that be to enliven, you know, enliven ourselves or to have a greater identification with something outside of ourselves. You're reminding me of that song by Sarah McLaughlin. I don't know if she's Canadian, actually, fumbling yeah. towards ecstasy. That's right. It's a great album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a fan. Um, when we talk about the unknown lost object and, you know, it could be, like we said earlier, the, the less than perfect um, parental figure, or nowadays as well, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Francis Weller, and he talks about the gates of grief and how we are born into worlds that, well, certainly our westernized culture, where the tribe that should be there to welcome us isn't the land that we should be able to be born onto and walk on, isn't there, you know, we're um, put into these boxes and our life is planned ahead of us, uh, for us. And he talks about the grief that comes with having to conform and social appropriateness and all that, like the wonder and awe. Um, like I remember as a child uh, having these moments of awe, very young, you know, looking at the sky and going, there's stars, you know, that's just amazing. And just being blown away by the fact that there were stars. And, you know, I rarely have those moments now. And I don't know if my children ever have those moments now. Um, there's something about modern technology, Western society that's stripping us of the beauty of being alive and perhaps a grief that comes with that, that again, maybe we're not that conscious of. We're missing something, but we don't know what we're missing. That's very well put, very eloquent. Um, what is that missing or lost object? Um, is a very good question to ask oneself. Of course, there are gonna be many missing or, or, or lost or absent uh, internal objects. Um, and I think these are ex, you know, existential um, quests or anxieties that we have to lean into. I mean, you're gonna learn the most about yourself by leaning into discomfort. Um, not about what you like, uh, that's self-evident. Um, is there a potential for a, a, an awakening in a person? Um, I, I, I really uh, thought I was moved by the way you introduced the notion of, uh, in other language, an archetypal grief that you there are things that are that are missing that should be part of your uh, inner experience by virtue of the fact that you have absorbed it in your culture, if not your immediate family life. I mean, we're not uh, we're not born um, fully developed uh, human beings, but we're thrown into a family, uh, you know, a particular time, place, culture. Uh, language, you know, a body, um, all these things, that, but they also stand in relation to uh, uh, the environment or um, the symbolic that is, uh, is already there. And um, it could be that particularly growing up uh, in a certain family and as a child in particular, that you're gonna be like a magnet around things that affect your parents. And the things that affect your parents are the things that affect, have affected them. Uh, so their life experiences, their traumas, uh, their hardships, their values, all of that is unconsciously being uh, communicated uh, to, to us our whole life in many ways. And then if you've got a greater uh, country or culture, that uh, has the scars of history. Um, that is kind of like our 
our metaphysical relation to uh, these greater elements that are operative unconsciously or that um, uh, interpellate our unconscious fantasies about how things should be. And I think we see that a little bit in the world of politics today. Um, and, you know, you said earlier, it's not always the loss of an object or person. It can be the loss of ideals, the loss of an ideology of how things should be. And I think, you know, so many people's chin just hit the ground when certain politicians were elected in and certain decisions were made. Um, and, and there's a grief in that. I remember... Um, when your man was, uh, that's an Irish expression, um, when, he, when he was elected four years ago um, in North America, I was in Switzerland at the time and I was with a bunch of American colleagues doing a moving uh, therapy workshop. And the news came through that, that he was now the president. And I remember one of my colleagues who's a psychoanalyst, a woman in her 60s, just curled up fetal in the corner, sobbing, um, as were many of the other Americans. You know, Europeans, we were really sorry to see it, but perhaps not so invested. But here we have a collective mourning, um, mourning the loss of an ideology of how the world should be, how we think our fellow citizens should vote and how we ought to think of each other. Uh, even with the current election as well, you know, fantastic that Biden is going to be in office, but also the devastation of seeing how many Americans voted for a racist. You know, we, we had yeah. a, a marriage equality vote in Ireland a few years ago where we legalized gay marriage and it was absolutely fantastic but you can't help but orient towards the 40% of people who didn't think it was okay. Um, so there's this, this loss of ideology as well and collective grief, which I think we're, whatever about the pandemic, we'll come to that later, but we're certainly seeing it in our politics nowadays in Brazil, in North America, and in the UK. Yes, uh, that's again, very, very lovely uh, segue into a, a greater mourning process uh, you know um, I, I thought I'd be personal reaction to Trump winning the election um, was that the American psyche uh, just became a split and um, and, and I was witnessing a, a, a collective psychosis. I mean, who would be wanting um, this type of individual as a leader? Uh, uh, and then, um, uh, of course, it, it dredges up everything. Uh, what happens if you have a bad leader, um, a bad father, a tyrannical, hateful, you know, vindictive, psychopathic, you know, individual? Um, these are... Uh, it's, it, it mobilizes everyone's uh, worst fears, uh, paranoid not, uh, reactions to depressions, to generalized anxieties, uh, to societal collapses. Um, but it, in many ways, is human nature to see how prejudice works unconsciously. That um, the extreme, of course, is when you need to have enemies. You need to have a hating object, the hating other that you are projecting your own hatred into as a justification for hating it. Um, and it, these divisions, um, it's again, um, if we go back to psychoanalytic theory, uh, you know, Freud and later Melanie Klein talked about splitting of the ego. Um, it's how we keep bad things out uh, uh, or, or from contaminating us. But unfortunately, it never works that way. Everything that's projected always comes back to, to roost. You end up identifying unconsciously with, with behavioral manifestations of the other, and you incorporate it back in yourself. And that could then lead to self-hatred. 
um, need for punishment and uh, or need for revenge. And it can it can bring on all kinds of traumatic internal states. Uh, uh, and then we when we have a, predis a predisposition toward um, our inner worlds being organized that way to begin with, and you have and you see tangible um, uh, events that are happening in the in the real world that then debilitate that feeling of um, uh, being able to cope, uh, as we see with the pandemic, um, that uh, these are dispatches from the unconscious, a and they can be quite overwhelming. And what what are your observations, John? around grief and collective grief, not just from death, but from uncertainty um, in these last 10 months of COVID. What do you think is happening globally? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, in many ways, it's, it's like one of these questions that's too big to answer and too big to fix. Um, that there's a, a great deal of destructive principles that have been unleashed on, on us. Um, whether it be uh, the Anthropocene, um, the climate change crisis that we're in, that we're causing, whether it be the evil that men do, um, the um, the the nature of uh, of our aggressive uh, tendencies or drives or uh, you know inclinations that bring about you know hate destruction death um, the the notion of how many societies particularly in developmenting developmenting or developing countries are um, Little, basically living in totalitarian states uh, or in extreme uh, forms of poverty. Uh, you know, you have the overpopulation uh, boon and the crisis that that's going to bring. You have the notion of disparities all over the world and uh, inequalities and in, in, in wealth and, and um, you know, food scarcity, uh, you know, water scarcity, uh, the apocalyptic thinking that um, is being revived in fundamentalist r religious uh, sectors of the world. Um, you've got the threat of nuclear war that's constantly looming over, uh, particularly the Middle East. And, um, uh, you know, are we living in the end times? And, and, and these are going to unleash all kinds of primal anxieties how do, how do we how do we possibly uh, cope with these types of traumatic um, experiences that have been superimposed on us? Well, we we're all a one man show in the end, so we have to um, um, find our own internal resources, but we also find them through collectivity and relatedness to others and cultivating a value system that we all can mutually identify with and find meaningful and try to bring about certain destructive forces that we foresee are, is coming in the future. So I am not gonna pr be pretentious enough to think that I'm going to answer that uh, important uh, series of questions, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share my anxiety and sit with, the, with you. I did a lovely podcast episode with my supervisor, actually. He's a man called Jerry Murphy. I have a podcast, John, um, covering different topics of grief. And I love Jer. Like, he's just so grounded, you know. And he's a, he's a poet and he's a philosopher and he's a, a psychotherapist. But he kind of starts off with, well, I'll talk as if I know something, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, I just love that. Yeah. You know, we just don't know yet. We do, we're in the middle of it. And um, there's going to be ripples for quite some time. And the nature of those ripples are as yet unknown. But how do we sit with fear? You know, how do we sit with that fear? And then also um, orient towards connection 
um, and ways to to settle our systems without mm. putting a sunny side up or focusing on positivity or any of those little pop psychology messages that we're being fed constantly. Um, you know, and I think the, the neuroscientists certainly say that the best way to conquer fear is to actually sit with it and just name it and feel it. I think it goes <laughs> goes for any emotion, really, isn't it? To turn towards it rather than run from it. Yes, I agree. And um, I think that's why, whether it be in psychotherapy or whether it be with, uh, you know, your loved ones or friends or, uh, or family, that having a you know, meaningful communication and having a dialogue uh, ab about the very internal things that you're trying to contain is uh, allows allows us to name it. it. It allows it to get it out of the table. It allows for us to articulate aspects of it that would have remained inside us. And if you can't get it out, uh, if you can't talk about the very thing that's imploding in you, it's going to um, be self-destructive. Uh, and that's why, you know, working with suicidal patients, um, that the most, uh, you know, important thing is for them to be able to talk about the details of what they're struggling with inside and, and, and get it out on the table and it, and it puts a ground under them so they don't have to act out on these impulses. Um, and also, you know, with giving with suicidality or whether it be the notion that one's going to be um, invaded or killed or traumatized by something external is um, uh, having to come to terms with our own negative feelings and, and desires about, about the objects that we're trying to um, process. So... Um, you know, when people hurt themselves or, uh, and they can do it in circuitous ways, like you mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, be having, developing an addiction. I mean, these are all very self-destructive aspects um, uh, that have depleted internal states that- um, It's like slow suicide. Yeah, yes. Um, but with, it, with um, the notion of uh, the suicide, uh, the person who's feeling they need to punish themselves or, or not, just not, they don't want to be here. They don't just, they want everything to be taken away, the pain taken away. Um, they, they're often not aware if they could be in denial, they could be dissociating this, uh, but um, they're often not aware of these intense uh, negative emotions, if not hateful feelings that are directed toward others that have to be denied, that have to be displaced, and then have to be um, inverted on the self. And, and because being aware of one's hatred for, let's say, a love object, it could be so uh, internally um, um, incomprehensible or so contradictory that uh, it can unleash, unleash very, very difficult uh, emotions where a person needs to hurt themselves because uh, it's too intolerable to maintain. Yeah, that's interesting. You're reminding me of um, something I said to my son, he's 13. And we, let's just say we had an altercation and um, in which his phone got damaged, <laughs> his iPhone that he spends way too much time on. But he was taking on his sister's advice. He was deciding not to be angry with me. And um, because he thought this is the way that he would get a new phone, you know, if he could uh, sort of and maintain that position, you know, and uh, I turned to him and I said, it's okay to be angry with me and it's okay to tell me you're angry with me. Just don't act out on it, but you are allowed to be angry and you need to say that if you are, you know, because this is where you know, that internalization begins to happen and where we start to see our teens, you know, acting out. Gosh, I see it over and over again, actually, in adolescence where that sort of natural anger with the parent, 
is internalized because the consequences are too big when they demonstrate it to the parent. And uh, we see them then in clinic, don't we? Or in our families where they're self-harming, where there's eating disorders, suicidal ideation. Um, so how do we get that anger, you know, back where it belongs? Um, would you speak a little bit to that, John? Well, it's a very difficult thing to do when you're a parent. It's a lot easier to do when you're a therapist. Yes, uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. It, um, it's very hard to uh, um, put, put on a therapeutic role with your family. Um, at the same time, if one can have a, a certain uh, attitude or sensibility about approaching uh, normal uh, developmental or emotional experiences in, in a way that opens up a conversation, allows for acceptance or allows for it to even exist is, uh, uh, would be an you know, extremely important goal that, that it sounds like you have achieved with your son. Whereas um, in many families, uh, it's very difficult for parents to let, feel assaulted themselves be lentiled, they feel deficit, they are uncomfortable with the emotions in their kids and and they may revert back to their own conditioning or how their parents raised them or how their parents treated them. And they're, they find themselves in, uh, in many ways in a, an unconscious repetition of, you know, like um, repeating the very things that they didn't like as kids and, and yet they've adopted the role of their parents. Um, and, and then when it leads to uh, mental health issues, of course, in adolescence, it's, it's very difficult. Um, uh, I think I, I'm more comfortable just letting my kids have more space uh, and and just keep reminding myself, don't say anything critical. <laughs> so don't be judgmental, don't say anything critical and allow them to, uh, to have their, their life uh, without interference to some degree. But of course, things like um, we're worried about social media and, and technology and, and a number of other destructive elements of society that, um, uh, you know, that we are encountering, I think, for the first time in recent history. Uh, it's, it's difficult for all of us to navigate, regardless of the role we're in. Well, I love that idea of just um, creating space for them. And, you know, that's something that I've certainly learned as a parent is how can I, you know, loosen up the need to control and just create a lot of space around, you know, one particular child, the others are quite okay with their boundaries. Uh, one of them needs a little bit more, um, but, but at a certain point, a very clear boundary also, you know. Um, so John, just to bring us back then to Freud and grief, mourning and melancholia, and something that you talked about in your lecture was looking at why do some people mourn or grieve and others turn to melancholia. So some people, you know, are able to turn towards the, the painful feelings and feel them and express them and, and integrate them and move through them. And other people don't. They turn more to, you know, maybe there's an initial mourning, but it becomes a melancholia and the grief doesn't get integrated, doesn't get accommodated. They don't adapt to their loss. Well, I, I, if I had to try to pinpoint something um, that would maybe differentiate the depressive from the, the, the agree or aggrieved would be the person um, has more, um, more ambivalence toward the love object. And, and, and that level of ambivalence is um, fraught with uh, much more internal conflict um, attached to that person. Uh, and, um, you know, 
usually uh, whether any kind of psychological, um, for lack of a better word, disorder, um, is uh, is going to have certain precipitating events, um, and that this you know usually you don't just develop. Uh, depression overnight you know it's not like uh let's say post-traumatic stress disorder where you know something hor horrific happens and then you're thrown into the state but for most um psychological conditions um that uh people find themselves in um uh have have had a life to them uh, of being prepared and usually there are these a ser if not one, but a series of precipitating uh, significant events, at least psychic significant events, that then stir up um, all kinds of um, both conscious but but unconscious meanings and conflicts. Yeah. And those con and those conflicts then tend to incubate and and they intensify and. And people may develop certain anxieties in relation to what's being stirred up. Um, some might be aware of what is being stirred up. Others just feel this horrible wave of emotion but, or affect, but they don't know how, what it's really about or connected to. Uh, they might start developing symptoms. They s might then try to find coping mechanisms to deal with the symptoms rather than think about, well, what, what's preceded it? What's, what do you think's fueling it? And let me try to understand it. But usually the psyche wants to get away from it to protect itself. And then people find themselves trying to cope. And uh, if those coping mechanisms or def defensive uh, maneuvers don't restore the self, then they might you know, seek out secondary kinds of defenses. Like they start over drinking or smoking or boozing or, or, or uh, you know, they were pathological uh, work habits, um, other things that, that are trying to cope with the very thing that they're running from. And then when those don't work, then we usually see certain clinical syndromes that, that will come out of it. Let's say clinical depression. Um, complicated grief, prolonged complex bereavement disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I see it in clinical practice as well. The people who have deeply loved and have had a very, you know, relatively uncomplicated relationship with their loved one who they might be desperately missing and grieving. You still know they're going to be OK because it's clean. It's like a clean grief. It's very straightforward. They will go through a process. It's quite normal. It's quite predictable. Um, and, and in that case, it's holding space and offering some grief counseling, maybe some psychoeducation, giving space for that. And there's usually a resolution where, you know, they're still grieving, but it's manageable and they go out with a manageable grief. Whereas with the ambivalent relationships, that's where, you know, it's roll up the sleeves, take off the jacket and it's, okay, we're here a bit more long-term, We've got a few more layers to uncover. There's a lot more sitting with, a lot more silences, um, a lot more delving into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, well said. Um, and, and, and because we're all uniquely individuals, um, meaning that even though we can have, uh, you know, collective shared meanings with others and identifications we are still left ultimately alone with our interior. And um, it's um, just like in dying, no one can stand in for you. Uh, you know, we're all, uh, we're all having to deliver our own death. Uh, so just, you know, the, the specialness of a love object and letting, so to speak, letting it go um, meaning not, not detaching from the value of that person, but having to re reformulate and revamp their internal presence in you 
And, um, and that's why in many ways um, we're in competition with our internal uh, dramas around our, our love objects. They, um, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, the content, so to speak, of, uh, of much of our uh, needs for relating to others. Hmm. I wanted to ask you about that, actually, John. Um, you know, you talk there about letting go, but, it, but yes, retaining something internally. And certainly when I was doing my master's in breathing studies a few years ago, and we looked at the theories of grief, and when it came to Freud, obviously his invaluable contribution to the field was recognized. And also how he talked about that need to let go. Um, and he wrote his paper, and it was very much about... Um, you know, feeling your grief and then detaching uh, from your uh, dead object or lost object so that you can move on, if you like, with your life. But then his daughter died and he sort of had this realization of, hang on, I don't want to let go or, you know, maybe I need to revisit that. Um, but I'm not sure if he wrote anything else about that afterwards. And then we also have this contemporary theory now of continuing bonds, you know, which is the opposite of letting go, you know, where we say that death ends a life, but not a relationship. So how do we continue? How do we continue to relate to our deceased loved ones and maintain relationships to them, you know, in a healthy way? Where would you say that fits in with Freud's paper um, about letting go? Um, and then more contemporary theories of continuing a bond of class and Silverman, somebody else I don't remember. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, John? Um, well, I, I think it's, um, you know, deeply, uh, uniquely subjective. And um, we can talk about general theories which may help us because it might help us feel like we're not alone um, but uh, everybody has a special relationship whatever that special means to the lost person so uh, you you know when you mentioned uh, you know Freud's daughter Sulfi who, who, who died of influenza um, uh, biographically as I recall um, the Freuds never really got over that uh, that death, and and more more difficult was the fact that her uh, child died three years later, uh, and so um, um, uh, Freud had had talked about just being devastated and uh, emotionally uh, as a stoical person um, and as a depressive himself. Uh, Freud would be more inclined toward uh, emotional detachment uh, toward many things in life, uh, like like many um, um, uh, you know char uh, character uh, what, do, what do they call it? almost a caricature of, of 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 a tough strong man you know should be like um, the um, you know the ancient Stoic approach uh, but our our heart is going to always pine for um, uh, for the love object and I think the the most we can we can hope for is to you know keep that person close to your heart in, in whatever way um, that's meaningful to that per to you as a person mm -hmm. um, some people um, uh, need to have uh, constant reminders uh, of that person in their life, pictures, objects, and they maintain, uh, you know, an imaginary relationship with them. The point is, is they don't want to forget them. Uh, uh, but then some other people feel too much emotional pain being reminded all the time. And particularly when, if a person does give up their, um, they have a certain type of acceptance of the real loss of that person, um, but have found a new love in their life. And, and hence it introduces a new ambivalence. Mm. 
um, the feeling of betrayal of, of your loving relationship to the person you lost by taking up a new love object to the degree that some people end up uh, sullying the new relationship because or poisoning it um, uh, unconsciously because it's they can't live with the betrayal of of losing their first love so to speak um, and it it manifests itself in so many different circuitous ways that, that um, I think um, in, in, in a, you know, like in time, you know, memories are not nearly as strong. There, are, um, to use Freudian technical language, there's a decathexis or a withdrawal of um, energy directed toward the person. And in, in many ways, that's, that's healthy and, and normative um, because to constantly stay um, in, ensconced in this emotional loss is uh, depleting. Yeah. And, and um, it's uh, in many ways a form of um, a masochism. We, we see that also that de- I can't, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, but in anticipatory grief um, where we know somebody is going to die and perhaps it's taking, you know, weeks or months or even years. And often there's a detachment or a decathexis. Have I said it correctly? Um, yeah. There's a, you know, because it's just too much to be perpetually anticipating this loss. You know, we do tend to withdraw a little. I have a, a sick elderly father who's been sick and elderly for quite some time. And I, I notice it in myself, you know, that need to detach at times um, and not be always on, you know, because it's just too exhausting otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, there's no reason for us to feel that we have to be um, uh, superhuman. Um, you know, to be, um, it's too painful. So finding some compromise between being present when you are, when you are in their presence versus, um, finding some space, uh, a healthy need for your own psychological distance from being overwhelmed. And, um, you know, of course, depending upon, how sick someone is. I mean, if someone loses their their head, I mean, they be, they lose their mind. They become demented, and they're no longer able to recognize who you are, uh, um, let alone have a relationship with you or speak to you. It's obviously easier to then mourn that person before they actually die. Absolutely. And John, you started off. Um, by saying, you know, we are all mourning at some stage and we are all at least having bouts of melancholia, if not um, experiencing it consistently at different degrees throughout our lives. And you've had a recent bereavement um, just a couple of weeks after I contacted you, your mother died. Yes, it was some type of uh, metaphysical coincidence or synchronicity that was happening. Yeah. And may I ask you, I'm curious from my own personal perspective as well, having studied grief and loss, and I'm curious when my father dies, what it'll be like for me with this new knowledge, you know, um, to experience a bereavement. And would would you be willing, John, to say a couple of words maybe about anything that surprised you about the lived experience versus the clinical or scholarly experience of mourning? Sure. Um, Yes, uh, it was um, a a traumatic loss in the sense that it was a very uh, rapid onset of a rare brain disorder um, called uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD. And um, uh, basically uh, my mother had um, developed a, a lesion or a tumor in her left temporal lobe, and it was abnormal. And 
and um, she, um, you know, went uh, went from my mother to a corpse in a matter of a week, and, and so the uh, the most un I think um, until you're living a death of a parent, you just don't know how you're going to feel, um, but. Uh, what what uh, I believe was what I would actually call a spiritual experience or a numinous experience was that myself and my brother and father were able to um, you know be with her uh, before she slipped uh, out of out of her cognizant capacities and and have um, a loving uh, recognition for all she's done. And, and share it in a very uh, emotional and beautiful way that um, you normally wouldn't ever get in a lifetime. So um, to me, that um, doesn't, of course, um, bring any consolation, but it, it would have been a way that I'd like to go. Yeah. Surrounded by the people who are most important and it sounds like you were able to be fully present with her as well. Yeah. yeah. This, despite, of course, um, you know, being in emotional pain and mourning, and it's, of course, going to take me a while uh, uh, to, fu to fully process everything. But um, I don't know uh, if there's much more one can hope for. Um, if there's anything that... I would uh, want to impart to people is that you should you should say what you'd like to tell your parents now before they're they're gone, and that that sense of you know mutual recognition and having a loving gaze with one another and is um, irreplaceable. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a, a lovely note to wrap up on, I think, John. Um, okay. And thank you so much for being willing to let us into that precious moment. Um, well, everybody, thank you very much for having us. Everybody that I've spoken to, you know, it's one of my prerequisites, if you like, that I'm saying to people is we are all the bereaved. We are all grieving. This isn't... Um, clinicians or experts or scholars talking about somebody else's experience. This is, you know, our common humanity is very much present when we speak about grief. Um, you know, it, it's it's such a leveler. It's been around forever. We will all experience it. And uh, I think that's what will make this project particularly poignant um, is that a lot of the people who are presenting on it have had uh, significant losses themselves in their lives. Well, I value the good work that you do and um, particularly that you uh, make this public for, for people to, to be able to have um, a way of processing their own loss and, and relating to others in a meaningful way. So thank you, Liz, for, for all you do. Oh, thanks, John. And um, for anybody listening here today, John has published numerous books and articles. And uh, he told me just before we started recording that uh, retiring next year to write some more books that are currently in between your ears at the moment. So I will link uh, to John's work um, in your bio that will accompany this video and really recommend looking up John's work. And there's a beautiful lecture on YouTube, which is where I found John, um, uh, called Morning in Melancholia. It's one of the first things that, that comes up when you look for it. So really well worth watching that YouTube video as well, which I'll link to. So John, total pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. My pleasure too. Thanks. Thanks.